This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. The opening shots of the Civil War were fired at 4.30 in the morning on April 12th, 1861, at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. Seven southern states had already seceded from the Union before the battle beginning with South Carolina, in December 1860. After the Confederate victory at Fort Sumter, another four states joined the Confederacy. The battle lines were drawn for the deadliest war in American history. With its superior naval power, the Union established a blockade of the southern coast to prevent or at least to attempt to prevent, the Confederacy from trading cotton for arms with foreign countries. The blockade was difficult, however, especially since resupplying required traveling far to northern ports. The Union, in need of a southern base, captured Port Royal Sound, South Carolina, between Charleston and Savannah, on November 7th, 1861, in a battle known to the Gullah Geechee still today as Gunshoot at Bay Point. When the white inhabitants fled, they ran so quickly that they left behind not only their homes and their crops, but also 10,000 people they had enslaved. Those formerly enslaved people would be freed on January 1st, 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. Until then, they were military contrabands of war. The Union held Port Royal for the remainder of the war, which allowed for what became known as the Port Royal Experiment, a kind of proto-reconstruction in the Sea Islands. The United States government and private charities provided material help for the formerly enslaved population in the form of food, clothing, and medicine. And the government put them to work harvesting and processing the cotton that the plantation owners had left behind. Philanthropic and abolitionist Northerners answered the call for volunteers and came to Port Royal starting in March of 1862. Many of those volunteers got to work teaching the formerly enslaved, who were eager to learn. By the end of 1862, over 2,000 Black children across the Sea Islands were learning subjects like reading, math, and history. It wasn't just white Northerners who came to help. Charlotte Fortin, granddaughter of the prominent freeborn Black abolitionist James Fortin, chronicled her experience, writing in The Atlantic, quote, My heart sings a song of thanksgiving at the thought that even I am permitted to do something for a long-abused race and aid in promoting a higher, holier, and happier life on the Sea Islands, unquote. Harriet Tubman, who had escaped slavery in Maryland in 1849, arrived in Beaufort in 1862. It was, of course, not her first time back in the South since her escape, 
she had returned round a dozen times, liberating 60 to 70 people, including many of her family members. As Tubman could not read or write, her purpose in the Sea Islands was different than Fortin's. At the request of Massachusetts Governor John Andrew, Tubman traveled to South Carolina to join the Union Army as a nurse, cook, laundress, and, most importantly, a scout and spy. Although Tubman's Chesapeake Creole was almost mutually unintelligible from the Low Country Creole spoken in South Carolina, she was able to form a rapport with liberated slaves that the white Union officers could not. Tubman debriefed the freedom seekers who arrived in Beaufort, learning the disposition of the Confederate forces, along with important geographic features of the nearby regions. In June 1863, Tubman and the U.S. Army put this intelligence to use. Late in the night on June 1st, three Union gunboats sailed from Beaufort, about 20 miles north, to the Cumbie River. The rice plantations on either side of the Cumbie were still in Confederate hands, but they were a lower priority for protection from Confederate forces than were the nearby railroads, especially during the hot summer months when most plantation owners would flee for higher ground to avoid summer illnesses. Under the guidance of Tubman and the eight or nine scouts she had recruited, abolitionist Colonel James Montgomery led the troops of the 2nd South Carolina Volunteer Infantry, which was made up of free blacks and former slaves, and a battery of the 3rd Rhode Island Heavy Artillery. With intelligence from escaped freedom seekers, they were able to avoid torpedoes in the river. Although one of the gunboats, the Sentinel, ran aground on a sandbar. Soldiers from the Sentinel boarded the other boats instead, and the Harriet A. Weed and the John Adams continued on their mission through the night. Along the riverbanks, the Union Army destroyed seven rice plantations in the heart of the Confederate breadbasket, burning the mansions and rice fields and causing $6 million worth of damage. At the sight of the Union gunboats filled with black soldiers, the enslaved workers on the plantations ran to the water, hauling their children and their belongings. There was no room on the ships for their bags and their baskets and their pots and pans. But the soldiers rescued as many people as they could fit on those two remaining ships, liberating seven to eight hundred people that night. In Tubman's account, she put the number saved at 756. The scene on the ships was chaotic, and Colonel Montgomery asked Tubman to, quote, speak a word of consolation to your people, unquote. With their different dialects and backgrounds, Tubman didn't see these freedom seekers as any more her people than Montgomery's, but she understood their fear and she began to sing an abolitionist song of the day called Uncle Sam's Farm, which included the lines, Come along, come along, don't be alarmed. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give you all a farm. As she later recalled, quote, I kept on singing until all were brought on board, unquote. Within days, 150 of the men who had been liberated immediately enlisted in the very regiment that had freed them, the 2nd South Carolina Volunteers. <laughs> 
Joining me now to help us understand this incredible story is Dr. Etta Fields Black, Associate Professor of History at Carnegie Mellon University and author of Cumby, Harriet Tubman, The Cumby River Raid, and Black Freedom During the Civil War. Hi, Etta. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I am thrilled to be speaking about this really important moment in American history. I want to hear a little bit about how you came to write this book. Your other work has been on rice. And this is, of course, a story of rice, but not just a story of rice. So how did you come to write this book? Yes, I like to say that this is the best rice story that no one knows anything about. I was actually working on two other projects. In addition to being a historian, I'm an artist, and I had written a libretto and was collaborating with a classical music composer who's really amazing. His name is John Wineglass. And we were writing what became Unburied, Unmourned, Unmarked, Requiem for Rice. So it's a symphonic work, contemporary classical, about rice and slavery. And as I was in the early stages of writing that libretto, I was looking for dramatic scenes from the primary sources, and I found the Cumbie Raid. I found Minus Hamilton's life history, and I was fascinated. And so I wrote, you know, that portion of the, the libretto, and I tucked it away somewhere. And then I was working on a book project, which I wanted to be a history of the Gullah Geechee. And I kind of started in the Civil War for a variety of reasons that are, you know, too long to explain. And again, I was writing about the Cumbie River Raid. So my interest was piqued. Both of those projects grew in different directions. And I was there in the middle. I came to a point where I had to, I had to rein them in. <laughs> I couldn't continue to go in these different directions. And so the intersection point, of course, was the Cumbie River Raid. And I couldn't imagine in at that moment that there was something about Harriet Tubman's life that we didn't know. You know, I just couldn't even fathom it. And even though there had been little written on the raid, I figured there was a reason and that there really wasn't any there there. So I, I, however, did some poking around and talked to a lot of people and tried to dig into a couple different kinds of primary sources, one of which was the pension files. And I struck gold. <laughs> I found on my first try the companies that were formed after the raid companies G&H of the 2nd South Carolina Volunteers. And within pension files that I drew from those companies, I found testimony of the Cumbie Freedom Seekers testifying about the raid. So from that point, I, f I figured, I, I had to figure it out, that there was something there that was pretty special. And I wanted to know more. And I thought that this could really reveal a part of this history that we had never heard. So I have to ask about your research methods, because as I understand it, you built this enormous database of these pension <laughs> records. So this must have been just painstaking work. Can you talk me through a little bit what, what it takes to find the stories in these records? A lot of patients. The funny thing is that after I, I, I really got lucky on my first try, on my first trip to the National Archives, and the first set of pension files I requested, and I was back at home, and it was months later. Then it did take me months and months <laughs> and many, many pension files before I found more evidence. So I, I was 
you know, it's it's funny to look at these things in hindsight because in hindsight, you have everything figured out. And I have to remember what it was like at the time where I didn't know anything. You know, the only thing I knew was that these files were long. Some of them, some of them were 300 pages long of cursive writing. Okay. I was transcribing them myself in the beginning and I was only going to read it once. (laughs) I was sure about that. And I, you know, I, there's so much detail in the files. It was this, the thing where I didn't even know yet what I was looking for. A couple files in, I started, you know, with each file, I was sort of building my knowledge and building the questions that I wanted these files to answer. And I figured I had to capture all of that. And thankfully, I figured this out at the very beginning so that, again, because it was cursive and it was pretty neat cursive, but it was cursive nonetheless, that I was going to read it once. I was going to do a full text transcription of it. I didn't care how many pages it was. And then I would enter by hand these transcriptions cut and paste into a database. So I started with a database that was about 40 lines, 40 columns long, 40 columns wide. And the rows were the veterans. I had pulled the names of the veterans in companies G&H from a couple of sources. And, you know, we so much at the time was not digitized. Okay, I'm going back now to 2016. So much was not digitized. So I'm ordering rosters through interlibrary loan at at the library. And I had an undergraduate to put them into this Google sheet. So as I got files and as people, because the thing about a pension file is it's not just the veteran, it's not just the widow, but it's all these people who come to testify And a lot of times that's the most interesting testimony. So I had to capture all of it. I had to know where I got it. I had to be able to retrieve it. And I'm only going to read this thing once. Okay, so I'm not going to take notes on it. I'm going to transcribe it, put it in the database. Then I started a second file because it was clear to me that I had some repeat offenders, if you will. I had some people who testified a lot. I had some people whose testimony was very detailed. I had people who knew all the news about everybody else and they were happy to tell it. I had people who testified about the raid, right? So I broke those folks out into another database and began to, and I also wanted to be able to identify approximately the birth date of the person. And believe it or not, this is actually very hard for enslaved people. It was less difficult for the veterans than it was for the widows because the veterans had enlisted. And so at least there's a birth date on their enlistment record. I wanted a general, you know, notion of how old the person was. If I could get a couple points of data, I broke them out and put them into another database. And then with my research team, we began to layer all kinds of other documents into this database, whether they were slave transactions, and that would be wills, estate records, bills of sale, mortgages, uh, marriage settlements. I think that's about it. I'm sure I'm missing something, as well as things like their Freedman's bank account, right? Or the census and their life, if they told life histories. And I, I wanted to compile all of this. And it's the people for whom I had the most data and the richest testimony. Those are the people who became the main characters in the book. So the other type of research then that you did was to actually go to these physical locations and experience what it's like to be in a rice field and what it's like to go down this river. Could you talk a little bit about how that puts you then as a writer in the mindset of the the people that you're writing about. Yeah, that was really important to me. That was really, really important to me. I wanted to try to understand the raid from the perspective of enslaved people. And that in and of itself is very daunting because there are so many aspects of 
that experience that I could never access, you know, even as an African-American, even as a descendant, you know, even as a granddaughter of the region, I will never, thankfully, you know, be enslaved and compelled to do the kind of labor that they were forced to do in these rice fields. But I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get the landscape. I wanted to be very clear about the landscape. And I wanted to know, you know, what would it have been like at 4 a.m. in early June, you know, and be able to paint that picture. So I did a number of things. And first of all, let me say that I had my partner and my partners in crime. I was hosted by Nemours Wildlife Foundation, which is in Buford. So I lived on the Cumbie. I lived on the Cumbie for over a year. I was not there consecutively, but there was a stretch, about a nine month stretch, when I was there every month for about 10 days. So, what that meant is that, first of all, I hiked in the rice fields as often as I could, you know, just about every other day, sometimes every day, weather time permitting. I saw those rice fields in every season. And I saw them in every stage of tide. And I saw the critters, I saw them, you know, develop over over their life cycles. And I got to know their sounds. I got to know their, you know, what they sounded like when they jumped in the water. That was very important. (laughs) So that was one thing. And I'm someone who knows rice fields very, very well. I there were scientists. This was a it's a it's a wildlife foundation. So there it's a research center. So there are scientists there who work there, some of whom live there. You know, I'm in in the house <laughs> where everybody has lunch and people have breakfast in their offices. So it was easy for me to run downstairs and say, hey, I have a question. <laughs> and we would jump in the truck and go and look at it. And I should say I had access to six of the seven plantations. So from plantation to plantation, I would walk, you know, we would walk, we would drive, I would ask questions, et cetera. One thing, as much time as I've spent in the rice fields, I had never done was walk barefoot in the rice fields. And that was one of our little reenactment projects. And we did walk barefoot. I wanted to understand how people who were in the rice fields got to the boats. And I had a theory that they ran through the rice fields, which was totally wrong. <laughs> totally impractical. So it was. it's more likely that people climbed out onto the dikes and ran, walked, you know, on the dikes, which are these earthen embankments that hold the Cumbie River back from the rice fields or that separate, you know, different fields. They're much sturdier. They're a lot less slippery and they're a lot less prickly. So that would be the most practical thing as opposed to trying to run through the rice fields. We went up the Cumbie. I went up the Cumbie a couple times, but I guess three times. The raid took place under the full moon. So we went up at night under the moon with no modern gadgets. We went up with, we used a motor, but my colleague and friend set the motor so that we were traveling very slowly about, I can't remember the mileage of the gunboat that was sort of the lead boat in, in the expedition. So we tried to recreate it. And what I learned and what my scientist friends had told me was that the moon shimmers off the water. So you're going up this very serpentine river and the Cumbie has some very serious curls, as they call them in the low country. And you're you're navigating by the moon that is shimmering off the water And it's in the middle. And on one side, you have rice fields. And on the other side, you have marsh. So I had to learn to stay in the middle as we went up this curly river. I went up the next day and we ran aground at the mouth of the Cumbie coming off the Kusaw River. And of the 
you know, three gunboats were used in the raid. They came up from downtown Beaufort, went up the Kusa and ran aground. So we had a similar experience there. And I also had friends who took me into the creeks. And so this is also, I write about this in the book, because when the gunboats pull up at Joshua Nichols boat landing, they came through a creek in the rice fields. And so we went up in that creek. <laughs> and it's interesting just how tight it is, you know, and how important it was that the John Adams was double ended to go in and be able to come right back out because that creek, those those rice field creeks are are pretty small when you think of of boats this size. So those were all of those experiences really gave me a better sense of of the landscape and how to communicate that landscape. I will say that the alligators and the snakes are also an important part of the story. <laughs> so as we're walking barefoot through the rice fields, we encountered a baby alligator and the mother alligator was not far behind. So this is how I know that it's not a good idea to try to run through rice fields. <laughs> it's clear from everything you're saying that they had to have really good knowledge of the region to do this raid. So can you talk a little oh, bit yeah. then about the importance of the intelligence that Harriet Tubman is able to gather, that the formerly enslaved people who are now in the army have with them? Like what what all of that how they were able to contribute to this incredibly successful raid. Yeah, it was, first of all, I'll say that, you know, Tubman's role and her role as an, as a, a spy is not described in the military record. However, the military record is replete with references of the U.S. Army getting intelligence from enslaved and formerly enslaved people. This was commonplace, right? Because the enslaved people, as you said, knew the region. So we know that Tubman was, she worked in the refugee camp. So this is the camp that was set up to house people and to process people who were coming from Confederate controlled territories, and they're coming into the Union controlled territory. This is after the Battle of Port Royal in November 1861. So, these people who are coming from the Confederate side, you know, they knew information about Confederate installations, they knew information about Confederate weaponry, you know, they knew a lot about what was going on over there. Tubman, we know from a letter written by um, William Lloyd Garrison's son, George Garrison, would interview these people. She would talk to these people. She would find out what they knew. And she would share this information with the U.S. Army commanders. And according to Garrison, she made it her business to do this with each and every person who came in to the camps. And she got more intelligence out of them than anybody else. They trusted her. They trusted her. She was a part of the community, even though she didn't speak the same dialect as, as the people did in that region. And even though, you know, some of their ways were a little peculiar <laughs> and her as were hers to them. We also know that Tubman found the men who the Confederates used, the enslaved men who the Confederates forced to put torpedoes on the Cumbie River. And she was the leader of a group of spy scouts and pilots. She said about eight or nine men. She and her men oversaw the removal of these torpedoes, according to Tubman's nephew. So this opened up the river to the U.S. Army for the raid. I was able in Cumby to track that there were people from the seven rice plantations which were raided who escaped 
enslavement and got to Beaufort, South Carolina before the raid. I've, I'm able to track them. There are several of them who are working for the U.S. Army Quartermaster. There were others of them who were working as carpenters, and some of them, including a man by the name of Friday Barrington, enlisted in the 2nd South Carolina Volunteers before the raid, and Friday goes back. His mother, his father, his sister are still enslaved on Cypress Plantation, and he goes back to Cypress Plantation. So it's it's highly likely that there are more individuals like that whose stories we don't know. But there are certainly Cumbie people, people from the lower Cumbie, people from the seven plantations that were raided and or people who were related to those people because there was a previous U.S. Army raid in this on the Santee River. And the Blake family owned one plantation on the Santee and one plantation on the Cumbie. So there were some people, some Cumby people who had been taken up to the Santee, who were freed and taken to Buford before the Cumby River raid. There's a number of people with Cumby affiliations who were in Buford who could have also provided intelligence to Tubman, to the U.S. Army. So of the 750 some people who are able to escape enslavement in this raid, uh, a lot of them are men of military age and they end up immediately joining the U.S. Army in what feels a little bit uncomfortable, like maybe they had a choice, maybe they didn't. Could you talk a little bit about that and what they go on to do then? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think that at an earlier period, at the very beginning of the enlistment of Black troops, before it was actually authorized by President Abraham Lincoln, there was coercion and there was force in, in enlistment. I think by the time you get to the Cumby Raid, and I'm, I'm speaking from what the free, Cumby Freedom Seekers say, I... I I would say that based on that, that they enlisted voluntarily. The wives, I'm thinking of someone like Sarah Osborne, Sarah Smalls Osborne, who says that, you know, we all got on the boat, we went to Buford, and the men went to war. By June of 1863, I think they were clear that they were going to going to war to end slavery and having liberated themselves, they were going, they knew that freedom wasn't free and that they were going back not only to protect their freedom, but to, to you know, um, play a role in the freedom of other people who were still enslaved after the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. Because if they were in Confederate controlled territory, they weren't free. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk some about the implications of this raid? It it doesn't just affect those people, although obviously it has an enormous effect on their lives, but it, it really in some ways changes the way the US Army thinks about what they're doing, you know, what what all comes out of this raid. Yeah, I think a couple of things. I think on the one hand, in many ways, the U.S. Army was in, engaged in some of this work prior to the raid. I think the raid showed that these kinds of expeditions could be very successful. And they could be successful at not only liberating people, but also filling the ranks of the, the Black troops with soldiers, that Black men would fight for their freedom. And again, this is something that by June of 1863, the U.S. knew, but they learned it in, say, St. Mary's. Uh, they learned it on the St. on the St. Mary's River, the St. John's River, these are primarily expeditions by the first South Carolina volunteers, but they knew it in smaller numbers, right? Here they know it en masse. And it becomes really important 
By the end of the war, there were 500,000 formerly enslaved people behind Union lines. So the U.S. Army, you know, the, the, the federal government knew by this time that enslaved people would escape if given the chance that if the U.S. Army was there, they would go to the U.S. Army. They would want, they would do everything they could, you know, to be, to liberate themselves. And this is the, it begins to turn the tide, right? It begins to turn the tide. It it begins to look as, as if the destruction of slavery was, was inevitable. I think also in terms of Charleston and the siege of Charleston, this is a very, very early step in that process. But I think it was an early beginning to the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy kind of the U.S. Army, let's primarily, but just in general, the U.S. military's designed on the siege of Charleston, the Cumbie River raid, you know, that whole ex- sort of ex- expanding um, the U.S. Army presence and being successful going into Confederate territory is is beginning to embolden them to to try that. Could you talk a little bit about your family connection to this history and what it's like to be able to do some of that research that that does connect to your your own family, your own past? Yeah, so it was a little surprising, you know, I I didn't know I didn't know for sure, let me put it that way, that my third great-grandfather fought in the raid before I really started writing this book. My father was born about a mile from where the raid took place. And I thought that our family had escaped in the raid. They they are so close. <laughs> and so, you know, as I was writing the Requiem and as I was writing the the other book, researching, this was sort of in the back of my mind. And I this was sort of a side project. You know, I had started the family. I didn't start it. I, I was given it. <laughs> I was assigned it. <laughs> And I kind of picked it up, I guess, around 2013. So, you know, I, I piddled at it when I had the time. And of course, it's it's in and of itself a full-time job. And everything I could find was that, you know, our family was buried on some of these plantations or their next door or whatever. I didn't know what was going on. And I assumed that we had escaped in the raid. We knew of Hector Fields. But we only knew Hector's direct descendants down to my father. We didn't know anything else about Hector. We didn't know his siblings. You know, we didn't know the names of his other children. We didn't know his wife's names. We didn't know anything except man, father to son, down to my dad, from Hector to my dad. And there were... And I got that from the census, which was given to me by one of my cousins. So I partnered. This was before the partnership. This was a friendship. This was like, you know, someone, my a good friend of mine, Tony Carrier, who at the time was the founding director of the International African American Museum, was helping me. She was doing me, you know, favors, trying to help me find my family. I think she was tired of hearing me complain. And... <laughs> the master genealogist that she is, she found Hector. And there was a Hector in in the records who had a military pension file. He had enlisted. It was evidence that he enlisted in the second South Carolina volunteers. But we didn't know of all those Hectors in the censuses, you know, we just didn't know if they were actually related to me. So... Tony had started a a USCT pension file project at IAAM, and they were collecting all of 
the pension files for the men who served in the black, the black men who served in the South Carolina regiments during the Civil War. And she came up, you know, I think she stayed up all weekend and reading all the Fields files. She came up with a file for Jonas Fields. And Jonas Fields' sister, Phoebe Washington, testifies in that file that she had two brothers, Hector and Jonas. And, you know, we were so confused about this Hector in Beaufort County because our family is in Colleton County. But she explained that after that they had been enslaved in Beaufort. And after the war, Hector and Jonas went to Colleton and they lived exactly where the Fields family that I know them lived at the time and still today. So it was the pension file of Hector's brother. Hector doesn't have a pension file. His brother had a pension file that opened up my whole family. Now I knew Hector had two siblings. I learned the name of Hector's parents, of their parents. So now I'm four generations back, which is very unusual for African-Americans. There were other people who testified in the file that they were enslaved with Jonas and Phoebe and their parents, Anson and Judy. So now I'm beginning, it's the beginnings of a, a, an enslaved community. And it gave me the notion that I could recreate, I could reconstruct the enslaved communities on the Cumby that escaped in the raid through the pension files. And so I, I partnered with the International African American Museum's Center for Family History and their USCT pension file project. And they acquired the pension files for those two regiments, G and H. And I, I went to work. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. Thank I, you. So there is so very much in this book. I'm obviously not going to get to ask you about all of it. Uh, I want to encourage people to read it. Everybody shows up in this book. We've got Charlotte Fortin, we've got Robert Smalls and Frederick Douglass. So how can people get a copy of this book? Yes. Well, you can go to bookshop.org and type in the search Cumbie. The pub date is on the February 26th. So I think we'll be airing <laughs> on, on the pub date, which is amazing. You can also get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes and Nobles. You can get it on Oxford University Press, which is the publisher. You can get it on Oxford's website. You can get it at your local bookstore. You know, I like to support independent bookstores. My favorite is Harriet's Bookshop in Philadelphia, which is named after Harriet Tubman. Is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talk about? Maybe I'll just say that Harriet Tubman's Civil War service is the least known and least studied chapter in her life. And so I feel honored to be able to shed light on that chapter and to shed light on the, the lives of the freedom seekers, it's, it's rare to learn the intimate lives of enslaved people. And I'm talking about their, their marriages, you know, their weddings, the births of their children, their relationships, all kinds of family details. And to hear them and the fact that they remember the names of their relatives going back several generations, right? To be able to reconstruct enslaved families. And that's the power of the pension files. I think that historians have, you know, our hands have been tied. And in many ways, we have relied on plantation planters' sources that are written by people who held our ancestors in bondage. And these sources deny the humanity of the enslaved. And I think that the pension files restore it because you have enslaved people telling their stories about their families and themselves in their own words and the Cumbie River. So I'm hoping that Cumbie is 
an intimate, it paints an intimate portrait of this ens- these, this enslaved community and a triumphant portrait of freedom. There is just incredible detail in this book. Uh, I'm so happy to have read it. And Etta, it was an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. I enjoyed talking with you as well. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends.